Greetings, this is Jim Lindsay. This is a introduction to the uh, material that you're going to be seeing in chapter two, as well as an explanation about the PC dissection information I want you to consume, and uh, just give you some guidance about how to proceed with this whole chapter two lesson. This is a little bit different than perhaps what you saw in the lessons for the first module, and so just giving you a, a rundown with this one, and then as you get to chapters three and four, you'll use the same strategy. So let's get started. So I'm on the Blackboard page, and this is the Chapter 2 uh, lesson folder. This is all coming out of the Freddy module. Uh, this is you know all about hardware. Freddy, of course, was the IT guy in iCarly. And so you know anytime they needed cameras or computers or microphones or whatever, Freddy was the guy putting it together. So it made, it made sense to me to put him and you know, name anything after hardware after him. And hardware, of course, is anytime you're talking about something tangible, you know, something you can pick up and and move on a computer, that's that's hardware as opposed to software, which would be a computer program. And we'll learn about that stuff in the next module when we get to the module name for uh, Carly's friend Sam. So that's what we're working with. And so in this chapter two folder again, as you look at, it, I've got a sort of a text explanation here of how to proceed. You know, start by scanning your chapter. Uh, don't don't spend a lot of time on that. Basically, go of go through there and quickly, you know, glean what the the main ideas are, what the, some of those key terms are, and then as soon as you're done with that, start into these lessons. And as you make your way down this this list here, you know, you are here. So thank you for for starting that. Um, these slides that I'm about to open up, the slides for this lesson are are right there. And then as you make your way down this list, and you'll just bas basically make your way down this page. Um, this is a really good video. This components of a computer. This came from the, the gaming PC site, which basically has guys put together a really nice gaming computer. Uh, if we were in a classroom, I would have you be taking old machines apart. But obviously, because we can't do that right now, you know, even if we were in a classroom, if this was a hybrid class and I had you in a classroom, I still couldn't have you take those machines apart just because of all the, the germs and stuff that get spread as you take things and touch things. So this is a really great alternative to that. And so, you know, you watch this and you, you see the components I'm about to point out to you in this dissection thing, you know, very briefly, but then you'll see them here. And that's a, a very nice substitute for what we would have done in the classroom. You come down here to this one, you know, how a computer chip is made. This is sort of if you're if you're curious about how stuff is manufactured, which interests me. I love going to factories and plants and seeing that sort of stuff. So you get to see uh, the, the production process of how computer chips are manufactured. And you'll then see in this one uh, how a CPU works. This one is a very dry video, but it's a great video. Um, get a cup of coffee, get a Coke, and sit down and watch this one. It may take you a couple of sittings to get through this. Um, what, it's, it's an animated video where basically the guy describes um, how data is transferred from one part of a computer system to another part of the system through the bu what's called the bus system. And then once it gets there, how it's processed and you know how the, the processor itself, it has uh, different components and how the control unit tells the uh, other components to go get data and then do uh, its work on them and then move that data from one point to another. So this is cool because as you read about it in the text, if all you did was read about it in the text, it's very abstract. But once you, again, just scan through the text and then watch that, and then as you go back and you read the text a second time, it should make a lot of sense. And so, again, that's, that's one it may take you a couple of tries to get through, but you have the link to it, so, so uh, make sure you're checking that out. This one down here, the data and program representation and its slides, which are right down here. This is where I'm talking to you about that whole process of how you digitize something. How do you take a song, for example, or how do you take a picture and convert that into numbers and then store that on a computer's hard drive as ones or zeros. And so that, that digitization process is described uh, in this lesson right here. And, and, and this content and, and much of what you're gonna see from, I'm about to show you in the, the, uh, the PowerPoint slides, this came from a guy named Dr. Thad Cruz, who's in our department, uh, just a fantastic teacher. And, and so uh, I thank him for providing that information to the rest of us and I was able to uh, you know, cannibalize and take that stuff and put it together in how I like to present it. So that's how you, you attack this lesson. Um, as you look at this Freddy module, you know, you have three chapters. Each of these is going to take about a week. 
you know, it should take about a week. The chapter three, maybe less than that. The chapter four is a lot. Chapter two is a lot. So between the three lessons, you're going to spend about three weeks of, of learning, just like you would in the classroom. And so um, start now. Make sure that you're getting into this and you're, you're, you, you know, you're, you're devoting the energy and the, the thought to it because this is stuff that a lot of people haven't thought about before. And so this is something definitely going to stretch you a lot more than the first module did. The first module is pretty overarching and general, and now we're starting to get into some details. And so you know, give yourself a chance for success and get started into this stuff early. So let's get started. I'm going to get in chapter two here with this dissection uh, lesson right here. I'm going to jump over to PowerPoint. I'll see you in just a moment. Okay, in this lesson, I hope to get through this really quickly because um, the movie that you watch from the PC gaming site, which shows you the different components, that's going to show you the, the different parts. But before you get to that, before we would get to the what I call the cadaver machines in the classroom, I would run you through this exercise and this part that, that you're about to see right now. And it's very interactive, and so again, it's going to be shortened up in this version. But um, what I, I like to present to you is stuff that uh, not only I got from Dr. Cruz, but also from a guy named Dr. Jeff Butterfield. And some of you uh, may know or, or, or met, you know, th those guys. They're really good teachers. And so um, one of the things I think Dr. Butterfield does that's really cool is he, he tries to put things into a historical perspective and show people where stuff came from. And so to that end. I like to show you the first electronic computer and so you know we're going to spend the re remainder of the semester talking about these machines we call computers right well the first electronic computer was this thing that you see right here it was called the ENIAC and that's a, an acronym for basically this uh, machine that the Department of Defense wanted to create something called ballistics tables for field artillery I'm going to show you what field artillery looks like in just a moment but um, this was, this all occurred during World War II in the United States, and as you know, as if we were in a classroom, what I'd basically be prompting you say like, hey, who was our main foe, you know, uh, during this whole thing, and and uh, you know, try and get you just putting this all into historical context. And so, um, what you'll see as you look at this picture or these pictures of the ENIAC, you can see how large it was. It was a machine which actually took up an entire room and so this was not unusual this was you know, when you think about the first electronic computers they all kind of did this and, and you may have heard terms like the central processing unit well this part in the middle out of the room out here uh, we still use the term central processing unit uh, because the the processor part the brain part was out in the middle of the room because as they ran wires out to the rest of it it made it easier to uh, to do that just because it was in the middle and you could just run you know either stuff on the floor or on the ceiling out to the uh, the parts you see out here and so this was your first electronic computer um, the reason we needed this or the reason that the Department of Defense thought it needed a computer was for uh, basically helping to win the uh, the fight against the the Axis powers in World War II so hold on one second I want to show you something I want to show you what field artillery is all right, so I'm at a Wikipedia page, and you've probably seen pictures of cannons. You know, you've, if, if you've ever gone to any sort of um, battlefield or any sort of museum where they have anything related to the, the military, they'll often have cannons, you know, these sorts of pieces that uh, were used in, you know, by, by military units or maybe even in combat uh, to, to win a fight. And uh, here's a, a picture of, of one. This is from a video where um, there's these guys are actually firing rounds out of this 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 big cannon right here and so this is field artillery when you think about this kind of weapon um, think about how difficult it is to predict where this thing is going to land like when you when you fire a projectile out of this gun you know it goes boom and it shoots out of here this thing can literally go miles and so trying to predict exactly where that thing is going to impact the ground or or, or explode over the over the ground is very very difficult there's a lot of math that goes into that think of all those variables like the temperature and wind and humidity and you know what kind of munition is actually being uh, projected from point A to point B several miles downrange and so it's very hard math that's why they needed these ballistics tables and if you think about World War II let me jump back to the PowerPoint presentation as you think about all the the fighting going on across the globe during World War II you know, you had 
thousands and thousands of people that were using these types of, uh, of, of weapons in this effort to, to win the, the war. And so most people, uh, the, the, the before, and the, you can see that this job did not complete until after the war was done. Uh, World War II ended in 1945. However, the ENIAC was built, it was completed, and upon its completion it went into service and it worked for many, many, many years. And uh, the cost of this thing was, as you can see at the time back in 1943, $500,000 was devoted to this. And in 2020 dollars, that's about close to like $7.5 million. Um, to get that done, but you know what was doing the work to create ballistics tables before this thing could get done was people. You know, and imagine it was a lot of women actually, like women mathematicians. And you imagine going to work and spending eight or twelve hours a day just doing really hard math for eight or twelve hours a day. Think about how tiring that would be, and think about how uh, you know how accurate would you be at the end of the day, at the end of your shift, if you're trying to do that very complex math. And so this kind of machine was 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 wished for just because it took that human fatigue factor um, or you know machines don't get sick and machines don't get sad and machines don't you know want to go on vacation and so as a result of that this was very highly desired so this was the first electronic computer again it was it was built it did go into service and I've got a link down here the, and you have the PowerPoint slide on Blackboard you can get down here and, and uh, you know look at uh, if you look down in the notes of this, you'll see links out to stories about this, and you can see like uh, how how this thing uh, actually functioned. The brain of it ran off of something called vacuum tubes, and as you look in the picture right there, you'll see that the the, the central processing unit right here it contained about seventeen thousand or seventeen and a half thousand vacuum tubes, and vacuum tubes looked like this. Think of a light bulb, and this was the brain, and so you know, as we digitize things, as we make things into ones or zeros, you know, we're we're making digits, numbers, right? So we want to take our 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 variables and, and convert those to ones or zeros. The way you store a one or a zero is with you know whether the, the vacuum tube is on or off, and so that's what makes this. That's why computers use a binary numbering system, because you've got a, an on state or an off state, and so uh, you can take. And you'll learn about this in the, the other lesson, that data representation lesson, where you basically can take, you know, the number 51, you know, that's the decimal number. You can take that and convert that to binary. Um, it's a very simple process, but, you know, the way that we stored, or that the way that they stored those values in the processor of the ENIAC was with these vacuum tubes. These were fragile. These things would break. Um, and they, they were not ideal. As later electronic computers came out, these vacuum tubes were replaced with something called a transistor. And as you look at these pictures of transistors right here, you'll see that the transistors got um, smaller and smaller and smaller. This is really important because the, the miniaturization of these components is what one of the major factors in, in, in how well computers have basically evolved and how quickly they have evolved. You know, we can do so much more with the computer now because, you know, one of the main reasons is because all of these transistors are now uh, microscopic, literally microscopic. And then, you know, they started as with something the size of your fist and now they're, they're down to something where you, you can put billions of them into something the size of your, your pinky fingernail. It's really amazing. And so this is, um, you know, the brain of the ENIAC was, was running off these vacuum tubes. Um, eventually this, you know, very quickly this became transistors. Those transistors shrank and now we're to a, a state where we, we can put lots and lots and lots of transistors into um, the processors of, of our computers. I'd like to show you just one or two pictures of, of a modern processor. This is a microchip right here. That's a pinky right there, a person's finger. And so that, that little chip right there, uh, it if you zoomed in and looked at it more closely, this is a, an old picture, so this is like a quad-core processor. Uh, they're, they're even more advanced now than when this picture uh, was, was taken. But these concentrations of brown that you see right here are, are concentrations of, of transistors on this thing. And so again, we're getting billions of transistors into something the space of your, your pinky finger. Now, that just makes it so you can do that many more operations, that many more execute, execute that many more mathematical uh, 
problems um, right there on that chip really is phenomenal. Okay, so as you read the book, you're going to hear about a, a guy named Gordon Moore, and he talks about there, there's something uh, that's named Moore's Law, and you can read Moore's Law on the slide right there. I'll give you a moment. He made that prediction back in, I believe, 1969, and it, it held true until, you know, very recently. Um, we're at the point now where, and, and what that's basically saying is that, like, every two years, computers get, computers get chips get 100% better. And so that's why we've just had this, this uh, you know, really incredible evolution of these things and their abilities. We've finally reached the point where... Uh, we have transistors so small that it's it's physically very very difficult to make them even smaller. You know, we just reached the physical uh, limitations of what our manufacturing process, and so now we're doing things that are described in the in the textbook. Um, you're looking at like 3D uh, processing. You're looking at like quantum computing. You're looking at at these alternative means to basically continue the improvement of the of the processor's abilities, but you know. Gordon Moore, he, he was one of the, the co-founders of the Intel Corporation. If you've ever bought computer chips before, Intel is one of the really well-known brands of, of computer chips. Um, you know, this guy's prediction from 1969 up through, you know, into the, the 2000s here, um, he made a, a, a really great prediction, really accurate prediction, and that's what that's, that's talking about. Okay, so to, to wrap this up, what I would do in the classroom is we'd have a contest, and I'd say, hey, okay, so remember that ENIAC? That I showed you a picture of, and everybody say, "Yeah, I remember the ENIAC." And they say, "Like, when was it built?" And they say, "Back in World War II, you know, between like 43 and 46." And it's like, "How much money did you know the, the Department of Defense spend on that?" And people say, "Like, five hundred thousand dollars of that money." And I say, "Okay, how much of you know, today's money? About seven and a half million dollars." Say, "Okay, here's your challenge. Here's your question: um, What current computing device has the same processing ability as that ENIAC?" We spent basically seven and a half million dollars for what? If you were to compare that to something from today, you know, you're looking at something from, you know, for example, let's say you thought it was uh, a, a, an iPhone. Well, I think it's like an iPhone 3 and it costs six hundred dollars. You know, that's what I think has the same computing ability as what we spent seven and a half million dollars for. And then I put you guys in, you know, give you a moment to, uh, usually you're working groups on this and you like, it's a contest, so whoever finishes first, if there's any sort of tie, you have to give me a, a, a product and a cost of that product. And so I, I put that out there. Um, and the answer to it is basically, and then after all the things have come in, I then show you the answer to the question. But the, the modern day device that has the same computing ability as this ENIAC, which we spent $7.5 million for, is, ta-da, a calculator. And this actually is kind of an old, it's probably about $4 now versus $4.22. And so you, you look back and go, oh my goodness, you know, we spent $7.5 million for a calculator. And then I, I would ask you to consider, you know, was that a, a wise expenditure of tax dollars to get a calculator? And then I, I, you know, listen for your thoughts on that. And most of the time what people come back and say is like, after they've thought about it for a while, is go, yes, it was. You know, we wouldn't have the four dollar calculator now had it not been for this ENIAC machine which started the whole ball rolling down this path. You know, something had to to break the ice with it, right? And so, um, and I agree with that that assessment. Uh, you may not, and that's okay if you don't, but in my assessment, you know, this was a, a pretty cool use of tax dollars because look at how much of the world is is dependent upon uh, computer technology now. And again, this first electronic computer really this ENIAC was, was instrumental in making that happen. So that's one of the first parts of this, this lesson. I really want to get you um, just thinking about these ideas. What is a processor? Because that's what you really learn about in chapter two. You know, what is the processor? What is, what is a bus system? Um, and, and so this kind of gets you leaning into it and, and, and thinking about, you know, what those things are and what the first one, what the first electronic computer looked like. Okay, to wrap this up, uh, this, this intro part up, uh, just to give you one more example of how much things have improved with computing abilities, um, I'd show you this. And this is uh, obviously one of the, the, the current 
you know, iPhone versions. And as you look at it, uh, and I want you to, you know, think about its processor. What kind of processor does it have? Well, it has this um, bionic processor, and it, you know, we start looking at the details of this processor. And, you know, again, think back to that ENIAC. It had 17,000 vacuum tubes in it, right? So it's 17,000, 17,400, you know, vacuum tubes, or if we were going to say they were transistors, transistors, you know, but they were, they're basically circuits which could be you know, used for the, the arithmetic, right? Um, in a modern iPhone, what you have is basically something that has eight and a half billion. That's just in a phone. That's not even in, in, a, in a high grade computer. That's just in a, in a telephone. And so, again, it's really amazing. That's, that's basically a 49,000% uh, improvement from 1943 to present on, on computing devices. So, again, just a, a one more concrete example, which you guys have, have, have your hands on, quite possibly, you know, the, a pretty modern phone. So, um, so, great. So, thanks for your attention on that. Let's keep moving. Let me get you with, into the dissection part, so then you can go to the, the video from the, the gamers. Okay, so I'm going to move you over to the dissection here. Um, as you move into that dissection, keep these ideas in mind. Since the ENIAC, everything has gotten smaller. We talked about that miniaturization process. We, everything has gotten faster, and things have gotten cheaper. And so there's there's material that you can read on that. And again, you have my PowerPoint slides, so you're welcome to you know pour over these and and uh, read those things in more detail, but everything has gotten smaller, faster, and cheaper. With that in mind, let's now look at the parts. What makes up a computer? Whether it's your phone, whether it's your desktop uh, you know, machine that you can't move, whether it's a laptop, whether it's a tablet, what are the components which make that thing up? And why should you care? Well, basically you should care because you're going to buy these things. And if you're not gonna just buy them for your personal use, you're gonna buy these for where you work. You may be in charge of purchasing, or you may be the business owner, um, or you may get to a job like uh, I was, before I was a teacher, I was doing IT for law firms, and the associates, the college students, which would come to work for us in the summer, one of their compensations was basically a computer. And so I'd go through with them and basically help them figure out what they thought they were going to use their computer for, and then put a, a computer together that, that met those needs. So this is something you may be doing very shortly. So let's, let's get an idea of what these components are in the machines that we use. Okay, so this is a list of things, and as you look in your textbook in chapters 2, 3, and 4, it, you're going to be learning about all of these different things in those chapters 2, 3, and 4. In chapter 2, you're really going to be concentrating on the processor. You're going to be concentrating on the motherboard. You're going to be concentrating on bus systems. Uh, as you go into chapter 3, where you start learning about storage, you'll learn about some of these others and so on. But the, the next slides are where we would get into like what these things look like. And this is where that video from the uh, from the PC gaming thing is so helpful. It's basically they, they show you the process. They start with a system unit, a case, and they take that case. It's just, a, you know, they just took it out of the box. There's nothing in it. And then what they next do is they put in a motherboard. Um, and on the motherboard, what they're going to do is they're going to put the processor on there. And on the back of it, you have to put these input and output ports that basically, uh, that's the top part of what you're seeing right here on the motherboard. So you orient this thing as you put it into the case so that these things stick out the back so that you can then put in things like printers uh, and, and other components. And so that's where that video comes in. And, and again, what they put together in that video is a really nice computer. They've got um, some M2, you know, solid solid state hard drives in addition to like regular solid state drives. Um, <laughs> they're kind of putting together like a, a very, like a sports car kind of computer. Um, the things I would have you take apart in class are, are not that nice. And so it's cool that you get to see that caliber of equipment in that video. So that's the process I hope you're going to complete. And you could, you could equate these things to physical parts of the body. Um, for example, the, the, the processor of a computer is basically like the brain of a human being. And that's the preceding slides I didn't show you in this, in this just to keep this a little bit shorter. Um, you know, your processor is, is like the brain of the machine. Everything that gets done has to be thought about and decisions have to be made. That's, that's the brain. Um, the, and then another part of the brain is basically the, 
the RAM, where you store things, you have short-term memory and you have long-term memory. And so you have hard drives, which is long-term memory, that's part of your brain. And then you have short-term memory, your RAM stuff, as well as cache, where you store stuff temporarily. So um, there, there are lots of metaphors you can use with the human body and then these components um, as, you, as you go through these, these chapters. And so please ask questions as you, as you are reading this stuff, as you're seeing this stuff, as you're taking notes. Please ask questions because I want to, I hope you're going to enjoy this and I want you to learn stuff that's going to help you be a much better shopper as you're going out and buying stuff for your personal use as well as at work. So that's the aim. That's the purpose of this. Um, thank you for your time and attention. You know what's next. Basically jump out there to that PC Gamer site and see if you can find these different parts and, and what they do uh, as, you, as you watch that video. And I thank you for your time and attention. Have a great day.